Good evening, everybody. I hope all all is well. Uh, July sixth. I hope you had a great uh, holiday weekend. If you remember, we uh, we attempted to go live for episode sixteen of the What's on the Line podcast last week and had some connectivity issues. So we're back. This is the June episode uh, now airing live July sixth. And so Wayne Young is back uh, to talk habitat, fish habitat, specific to the Chesapeake Bay, with us today. And uh, I wanted to give you a couple updates. I know last week I uh, shared with you that. Uh, we have a reef coming soon, the Janes Island Reef, and uh, well, for the last two weeks, we've been trying to get this one in the water. Uh, it has not happened yet. We've had various uh, headaches come along, and that's the business of reefing. Um, you'll notice one of the logos here I want to highlight is uh, the Ocean City Reef Foundation. Uh, that is led by Captain Monty Hawkins um, in this day and age, and he has done tremendous a tremendous job of building reef in the ocean. So he and I were chatting a bit last week about how tough it can be to get some of this habitat in the water. But uh, we're focused on this. Uh, this reef will not go in the water this week, but we're hoping next week, um, after this nasty weather gets gets uh, out of the way, we'll be able to put this Jane's Island reef in the water. Um, I'm also excited to tell you that we might have uh, two more reefs that get splashed in the Middle Bay um, before the end of July or the first part of August. Uh, we're focused on a MARI site or Maryland Artificial Reef Initiative uh, site at uh, Chesapeake Beach. And we'll, we're looking at deploying some reef balls there with uh, Chesapeake Bay Foundation and other partners. Um, and there's also a group of folks that are focused on additions to the Tillman Reef that we'll be supporting. Uh, the Midshore Fishing Club um, and some captains throughout the Talbot County area will be working with CCA and uh, we'll be getting some more reef in the water at the Tillman site, hopefully here uh, before the summer's up. So it's a, a, lot, a lot of moving pieces, um, but we're really bringing together a lot of reef balls that have been built over the last few years thanks to our great partners, and, uh, and finally sending them home where they belong in the water. Um, and so you can see on this, uh, this graphic here, the ccamd.org slash habitat. Uh, right now, the Janes Island Reef is not included on a map that we have on that page, but it will be very soon. And uh, you'll look for this graphic. It'll highlight the exact spot of the, uh, of the reef once the deployment's complete. And all the details will be updated here along with dates and, and latitude and longitude. So you'll be able to find that. Um, and also you'll see the same sort of graphic for every other reef we deploy this year. Um, and the whole goal of that habitat page of ours is to help you have a one-stop shop for great information, um, on the habitat, the reefs that CCA is involved in building. And, um, we're not the only ones, of course, you can see the list of partners on this Jane's Island reef. Every single logo there is, is part of, uh, what it, what it, what it takes to bring a reef together. Um, it really brings partnerships. And um, last week on the short little blurb I did, I mentioned um, our friends at All Tackle, uh, who are the newest um, people re that are selling. Oh, what's going on here? I'm trying to advance the slide. There we go. Shopping for Habitat. At All Tackle in Annapolis, you can buy some No Shoes Reefs apparel, uh, which is a brand made by Deep Apparel. Um, and it's directly supporting our habitat work here in Maryland. So it's directly supporting the Living Reef Action Campaign and our ability to build habitat in great places to fish. Um, through the sale of this No Shoes Reefs branded apparel that is being produced by Deep. Um, so if you're shopping online, you can shop at Deep. Um, otherwise, All Tackle has some limited sizes and, and designs um, in Annapolis. And please stop on in and, and tell All Tackle you'd like to see some more, and we can work together to, uh, to get some more product there. It's really simple. If you folks want to see this product or, or continue to see reefs, you buy this product and, and help support the partnership. That's, that's really how it works. Um, what's also exciting is some of these products from Deep are made from uh, recycled plastics, which are taken out of the environment and, and turned into shirts that you can wear to support habitat. So uh, again, it really takes partnerships. And um, if you're interested in, uh, in supporting um, these programs in another way, possibly selling this apparel, uh, reach out. There's an email floating across the bottom of the screen there, information at ccamd.org. And I can let you know more about how you can support habitat in our region. And uh, again, we'll, we'll continue to work hard to deploy more than the three reefs uh, this summer um, on your behalf. And we can't do that without our members and our great partners. So reefs, you know, I'm in a position, of course, uh, director of CCA Maryland to be able to do, you know, this kind of great work, to work with all these different organizations. Um, I think I mentioned it last week that Brian Sheets of Straight Edge Construction, um, he gave me a call late last fall or late last summer and said, you know, I, I fish with Monty Hawkins. I've seen the work that the Ocean City Reef Foundation does in the ocean. What can I do as an angler? You know, works every day, loves to fish when I have free time. What can I do to help? It's difficult for me to volunteer. And 
because of COVID and because of our program being stopped in the schools, uh, we were able to take our mobile equipment, our trailers, um, and uh, we were able to loan a trailer to Brian at, at Straight Edge Construction. And he and his crew had a great kickoff event last October to build reef balls with us and then really took the lead to work with Acme uh, Ceramic Tile, um, get a great donation from U.S. Concrete Products, and do a lot of great work on the Lower Eastern Shore to, to get this reef ready. Um, Bramble Construction, um, a, a you know large construction company from the Eastern Shore, has given us storage locations. Uh, Beltway Trucking, the Beltway Companies, is helping us truck material all over the place. And all these other partners you see have either rolled up their sleeves and gotten involved, like the Sea Scouts and the Girl Scouts, or really just helped with their with their financial support and their ability to make uh, partnerships like this happen. And so every single reef we've built through CCA has been done this way. Um, and Mari, uh, the Maryland Artificial Reef Initiative, is is was built on this this concept that we in the recreational fishing community and companies, uh, Maryland DNR and others can work together to enhance uh, reef habitat throughout the Chesapeake Bay. And so it's a, a big part of the reason that we have the Living Reef Action Campaign. Um, and Mike Malpezzi, the current reef coordinator at Maryland DNR, is doing a great job to help coordinate the work we can do to, to place material in the water. So we're not here to hear me talk about the work we're doing right now all night. We have uh, a great guest with Wayne Young, who I'll bring in right now. And Wayne, you can give us a great introduction to, to your past, because I know a little bit of it, and I'm excited to unpack more of that with our listeners tonight. Um, and I just want to remind folks that there is a uh, there is the ability to um, uh, oh one second you you can comment and I'm seeing some comments here um, and some folks are saying they can't see the graphic uh, Leroy so I don't know if you can still see the graphic it looks like that was from a few minutes ago but the the graphic is up uh, now and I hope you can see it um, and there's Eric Zlokovitz Eric was the last brief coordinator uh, in, in his prior position prior to Mike and uh, as he said. It's good to see the the Jane's Island Reef being developed. Well, it absolutely is. And uh, without further ado, let me add Wayne here into the conversation. Wayne, how you doing? Oh, hanging in there, pretty good. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for your uh, ability to roll with the punches last week and reschedule quickly. Uh, that the internet connectivity problems were on my end. So uh, thank you for your flexibility. I think we're both back home in our home offices today. So hopefully, good internet and uh, and good conversation. You're you still there, Wayne? Yeah, I'm here. Do you want okay. me to kick off here? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, uh, okay. tell us a little bit about what brought you here and uh, and the focus on habitat, and then we'll we'll go through the, uh, the presentations. Well, just a quick background. I'm a retired Coast Guard officer, and I went to work for the National Academy of Sciences, uh, their Marine Board, uh, after uh, completing Coast Guard service and got involved in a number of marine studies, one of which was uh, habitat restoration. And... Um, Reef balls didn't exist at that time, but we looked at artificial reefs. In fact, I did the research for the um, for the expert uh, national committee. I was the project officer, uh, did the coordination for them, and that ultimately led to a job with Maryland Environmental Service, which led to uh, uh, an unexpected opportunity to become the reef manager when DNR had a uh, budget austerity problem and had to uh, cancel their participation um, in the uh, reef program. So um, we got it and uh, we limped along. But uh, one of the things I wanted to, uh, to, uh, to do tonight was to, to go back to the history here a little bit of how reef balls got in the bay and, and why we're using them. Um, everybody knows, I think, that uh, the Bay Oyster Reefs were massive back, you know, 100 years ago. Uh, and they're a tiny remnant of, of what they were. They were worn flat by um, oyster dredges. Uh, there's still some out there, but they're they're pretty low. And natural reefs are being degraded by siltation, um, particularly in the upper third of the bay, which is um, the uh, turbidity maximum zone. You get a lot of runoff of the soils and, and so forth. So the loss of the biological carrying capacity of the uh, vertical reefs uh, hurts the uh, habitat uh, needs of uh, predators and the, the the prey that they feed on. And one way that we can uh, help overcome that is to build three-dimensional reefs. Now, the picture that you have up there is actually one from about 1990 by John Foster. Th those are tire units that were wired together and weighted with concrete. Uh, that particular unit is in Holocut's Newts over on the western side. And uh, that was 30 years ago. You can see how heavily it's uh, encrusted. You don't have to get them up very high to get the 
the uh, the reefs into better water, where the uh, current is is moving nutrients uh, by the uh, by the structure and helping uh, to uh, reduce the amount of sedimentation uh, they get. So, uh, like I say, that's a great reef. And I think you were before we got started. You mentioned that uh, uh, DNR was out looking at uh, a site. Uh, off Chesapeake Beach, and they found the tire units that are there, and uh, they, they're they're still there. How high they are, I don't know. We don't have any pictures, but uh, I would expect this is they've been in the water about forty five years, so they should be really heavily encrusted. Yeah, I bet yeah, that I bet uh, that is at the Chesapeake Beach Reef uh, location where some monitoring or pre deployment monitoring happened today. Uh, leaders from the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and, and Mari got together with some volunteers um, and or folks from the town of Chesapeake Beach as well um, and went out and looked at that site to identify a depth zone, a bottom type, and make sure that the investment we're making in time and money um, in reef balls is going to be a good addition to that reef. And they definitely found some old tire units. Um, so it'll be interesting to maybe you know maybe do some additional monitoring and, and get down there with some divers and uh and find out exactly what's on this site more thoroughly and maybe it'll be a, a good addition for another book well perhaps oh but you did have a very key point uh it's very important to know what the bottom is uh, we put in a a, a large reef and i wasn't going to talk about it, but i mentioned it it's um off of um holland uh, point and we had some uh, material from the baltimore harbor passenger terminal. Uh, a big quantity of it went in over Tillman Island Reef, and there's a huge reef over there, uh, two lines of demolition material, a couple hundred yards long, and you have reef balls on both sides of it. Uh, the same material went in over at Holland Point at the Fish Haven. Uh, we knew the bottom was soft, but nobody, charter captain, nobody knew how soft it was. We ended up with about two-thirds of the material going underneath the mud line, uh, and the reef itself has some sedimentation on it, and it doesn't develop anywhere near as rapidly um, as Tillman Island. A uh, DNR had a video of it, and uh, you could see the difference between the, the, the two sites when you looked at uh, two different videos. It's, it's amazing uh, what's over at uh, Tillman. And then you look at that same material at, at Holland Point, and uh, it's just not producing as well. So it's important to know what not only what the bottom conditions are, but also what the current regime is, to make certain you're going to get enough flow through there to help keep it clean. Right, right. And that's absolutely the, like your, the slide says right here. Um, we're talking about using designed reef structures versus materials of opportunity, things like bridge decks or, you know, something that's recycled into a, into a reef versus something like a reef ball, which is a specifically designed unit or the tire units, like you mentioned. They were designed with an idea in mind. Um, and, you know, we learn things as we move forward. So, Reef balls are what we're using these days, and uh, I'm sure things will change as we move forward. Yep. A note that tires can't be used anymore, uh, right. but they were effective when they went in, if they were put in correctly. Not put in a pile, but put together as a, a constructed unit. Why don't we go to the uh, next slide? Sure. Uh, what you're seeing there is a huge uh, railroad bridge cap. We had uh, 12 of them that were donated uh, along with the um, um, deployment services, which was important because when, when we got the uh, program when I was with Maryland Environmental Service in 97, it came with no money. Uh, we had to uh, some seed money from my organization to get started, and we limped along on that and small grants, a lot of volunteer hours, and most importantly, the donated material and the donated deployment because we did not have the money uh, to deploy the materials. Uh, Note that this is concrete, and the rebar had been cut off of it. Uh, there are some uh, big hunks of metal coming out, but they're they're like um, um, iron bar, not iron bars, but uh, um, like flat iron uh, sheets coming out. Mm -hmm. But uh, you don't have to clean it up c compared to a ship. So if you get a barge or something, uh, there may be some very substantial costs associated with cleaning up a, a tugboat, um, a barge. Uh, if it's a deck barge, sometimes you don't have to do much. That's one of the things Monty has uh, difficulty with. He has to get a lot of money in order to clean up the, uh, the vessels that are donated. 
And we're not talking, you know, you know, a couple thousand dollars. We're, we're talking in some cases, twenty five, fifty thousand dollars. I mean, it, it, it's it's a lot of money to get some of these reefs out there. So the materials that uh, we used in the bay during my uh, seven years with the uh, the program was mostly concrete and uh, reef balls, which we'll, we'll talk about. Uh, demolition materials and so forth that were donated that were basically clean. Um, one of the um, problems, I said, we didn't have any funds. So I started looking around uh, for technologies that we could use to uh, help us get grants to uh, support um, the, the reef program and also technology that we could use with volunteers. And having researched the artificial reef technology for the uh, Marine Board of the uh, National uh, Academy of Sciences. Um, I had an idea what I was looking for. And in 2002, I found uh, reef balls online. They didn't exist at the time, or at least uh, they, they weren't uh, out there on the internet um, when I was looking for the National Academy of Science. And I said, wow, we can use these things. Um, if we can get them on the right bottom, we can build them ourselves. We can use them for grant proposals because they're designed for hard corals, but they will. Uh, we thought they would colonize pretty much anything, and they've had real good luck with them in, in Florida. Um, and I also had an idea in the back of my head that uh, I didn't tell anybody at the time that if we could prove the technology through the reef program, then potentially we could use the reef balls as mitigation for port dredging projects. Uh, and my primary client was the Maryland Port Administration. Um, and uh, I probably shouldn't say this, but they had a not invented here syndrome. <laughs> you know? And um, if I told them, if I, in fact, if I had told the environmental community and others, I want to bring reef balls in so that we can use this for the dredging program, it would probably have been an immediate turnoff. So I didn't even bring that up. I said, we need to, to, to prove this technology first. And if it works, we'll have people asking us to use it for mitigation. And in fact, that's what happened long after I left. So you have to have a long-term perspective um, when, when dealing with artificial reefs, uh, not just because of, of that purpose, but simply because we can't put that many in all at once. It takes a lot of money. And over time, if you progressively build it as Monty has done, you get some really nice reefs. Um, that's a good point. I want to mention that, that that's something that's happened with CCA. If um, you know, I've been at the helm, gosh, uh, about four and a half years now and had different thoughts in mind of, of what we would have put in the water by now and, you know, how effective it would have been. And in 2018, we had a freshet where no oyster larvae was being produced by the hatcheries. Um, a big part of the living reef action campaign title is that we want to put in a living reef. And so we've been trying to deploy as many reef balls as possible with oyster spat already attached to them. So we had those you know, unknown environmental delays. And then in 2019, and then, you know, trying to, everybody trying to play catch up on the oyster front. Um, you know, I started pivoting and looking for different opportunities and 2020 came along. Um, and it seems like it takes forever to get some of these reefs in the water. So I'm glad you mentioned that kind of long-term vision, because that's something that uh, a lesson I've had to learn uh, with the day-to-day -day up and down. And just like I've, I said, to open this, this uh, conversation, we've had, we should have had the Jane's Island reef in the water two weeks ago, but things get in the way. So anyway, uh, let me say before we go to the next slide, there are six of those bridge caps sitting at um, um, Little Cove Point, and they were placed on oyster shell. Uh, there are huge uh, reef uh, down there, and there's also six of those over at uh, Taylor's Island. Now, at Taylor's Island, we had a hard bottom. At least we thought we had a hard bottom. And there's so much current there that they've the uh, bottom has been scoured um, around the structure, and a couple of them were put in a vertical position rather than uh, flat, as shown here in this picture. Hmm. And I have a, a, a sonar scan that I took uh, with my little hummingbird unit, and I found about one third of the the uh, vertical bridge cap was in a scour hole huh. below the original mud line, and that was because of the strength of the currents uh, rolling around it. It was clean. And there's a big fishing hole there, um, but probably not the best place to put it because of the uh, strength of the current. Mm -hmm. So that is, again, uh, one of the considerations. Uh, these sites way back when were not subject to the same rigorous environmental studies that are required today. And so we didn't have a lot of uh, 
good background data to, to understand the sites. We consulted with charter captains um, who, who fished in the areas uh, and relied on their judgment because that's, that's the best we had. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's still a lot more going on and we're learning more today with the uh, side scan sonars and down scan sonars than we ever knew before about some of these bottom conditions. So why don't we roll to the next slide? Okay. So in 2002, when I was looking for a technology and, and found the reef balls, it coincided with DNR's effort to find alternative uh, materials for oyster culture, uh, oyster shell being in short supply. And this provided a pathway to introduce reef balls to bay restoration. And it also uh, uh, offered the pathway to introduce them to oyster restoration. And I want to say that th this is a kind of a high cost o oyster restoration as opposed to just putting um, spat on shell and, and putting it out on the bottom. But the benefit we get is we're getting three dimensional reefs. We're getting them up off the bottom, we're getting them into cleaner water. Uh, and we're also um, guarding against sedimentation by the vertical vertical height. Right. So DNR sponsored a test of the suitability of reef balls as cult. And the idea was to put the reef balls in a sanctuary off point lookout to see if they could catch a natural spat set. So in the planning, um, Tom O'Connell, who was a, a fisheries manager at the time with DNR, uh, said, Tom, why don't we split it up? Now, we're not building a fishing reef, so having a large mass is not important. We need a big enough mass so that we, we can uh, find them. But uh, why don't we split them up and put them in three different sanctuaries, and we'll have a better chance of catching a spat set. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. And it wasn't, wasn't the primary site point lookout that got the spat set. Uh, the three sites that were selected were point lookout, um, the uh, one in Tangier Sound in the lower left-hand corner, and then um, the uh, Oyster Sanctuary off of uh, Holland Island. Roll to the next one. And what we learned was that reef balls rapidly colonize. Um, now, that has to be in the right growing season, too. They don't colonize as fast in the winter, obviously. Right. Um, but uh, in the uh, spring and summer, they, they just really go crazy. And uh, what we also found was that the other marine growth will outcompete oysters if you don't catch an oyster spat set uh, pretty much about the time that they go in the water. So one year after the reef balls went in point lookout, Ken Painter uh, went out with his ROV and um, he, let's see, he's at, um, I'm trying to think, is he Umsees or uh, I'm not sure where he is now. But uh, he went out with an ROV, and this is a reef ball that was at Point Lookout. And we also noticed that there was a sea bass coming out of uh, the, uh, the hole. What, what's on there is uh, anemones. And it was amazing. And that was our first uh, view of a reef ball with marine growth on it here in the uh, Maryland uh, Bay waters. And at that point, we knew we had a winner. This thing was going to colonize and we could use them and we could demonstrate that, in fact, that they, they would colonize. Now, what we also found out, however, uh, and I'll get to that in a minute, is that they have different colonization in different parts of the bay. Mm -hmm. um, so let's roll to the next one. This is Tangier Sound 10 years later. This is uh, taken from a Chesapeake Bay Foundation video, which you can find online. Uh, it's still posted up there. And it's what got the uh, Chesapeake Bay Foundation uh, really into uh, reef balls. I had previously introduced them uh, to it, and I'll talk about that here in a bit. But I wanted to call this up to show what an actual oyster reef looks like uh, on a reef ball. This thing is just like a natural reef. It's amazing. There were 25 balls over there, and every one of them looked like that. Um, it's, it's just profound uh, what, what it was there. The, the, the guys in the video were going out of their minds. They couldn't believe yeah. it. It was great. And uh, and you're seeing the same kind of growth, I believe, in the ones at Cook Point, are you not? Yep, at Cook's Point and, and at Tillman. Tillman, we don't have as quite as much um, kind of vegetative growth, whatever those extra things are um, yet, uh, but really have some great re uh, oysters. And in fact, I'll find a picture of that for, for folks. So let's go to the next one. Uh, Maryland DNR, uh, Tom O'Connell, 
who I might add was let go by certain administration for whatever reason, and it wasn't because of competence. Well, great guy. Um, had <clears throat> tremendous insight into what was needed to be done, and I was sorry to see him go. Anyway, uh, Maryland DNR uh, also sponsored uh, a reef ball test at uh, Eastern Bay at Mill Hill Oyster Reef. And the idea there, <coughs> pardon me, that we're, we're testing a variety of different materials as a culture or a substrate on the bottom. And they also wanted to try um, reef balls on some of the uh, Memorial Stadium rubble when they took Memorial Stadium down. So I ended up being the contract manager for that. And we contracted um, for the, uh, the rubble. The rubble got put in and the reef balls uh, got put on the, uh, on the site. Uh, they did not colonize as well as the ones uh, down at Point Lookout, but they did get some pretty good uh, colonization. Um, DNR also authorized the Chesapeake Bay Environmental Center to um, put some reef balls in at Prospect Bay, along with another product called Fish Havens. It has nothing to do with Fish Haven, but that's the name of the, of the product. They're a, a, a pyramid kind of product. And um, in order to condition the bottom, we had a lot of uh, Memorial Stadium, Stadium uh, rubble, so um, we made some of that rubble available from our project to the uh, Chesapeake, uh, to, to the Horsehead uh, Seabeck project. Mm -hmm. We also um, had a reef ball pour at uh, at Seabeck, um, which uh, I think we'll call that up in a minute. Um, DNR also sponsored at Memorial Reef. A, a major uh, project using Memorial Stadium rubble. It's now called uh, Bill Huppert's Reef. Uh, Bill was uh, uh, instrumental in bringing reef balls into the uh, MSSA, uh, was that Middle River, I think, Middle River chapter. Um, and he was uh, pouring reef balls with the uh, kids at uh, uh, elementary schools and middle schools. Uh, Bill and I both kind of stumbled into reef balls at the same time. And um, I think we got started first, but uh, when we had a training uh, session, I opened it up so that uh, we could get all the folks who were interested, including uh, the MSSA folks. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we we also, as part of that project, put in 90 reef balls, uh, a larger size. They're, they're uh, called bay balls. They're about 400 pounds. And some of them uh, had spat attached to them on site, what we did is we put, we had spat on shell from Horn Point, and then we put, uh, attached the shell using um, epoxy, uh, a waterproof epoxy, non-toxic, hmm. to uh, see if we could get them uh, to, to grow uh, in that way. Uh, so let me just make, check my notes here. This is on the uh, southwest of Gales Lumps. And today there's uh, well over a thousand reef ball there as a result of Bill Huppert's work, and mm -hmm. which is why the reef is named after him. Now, what we found there, well, uh, in fact, go to the next slide. Sure. There was one other part of that that's probably pretty, pretty important. The reef balls you're, you're seeing here in the upper left-hand corner were put in the tanks at Horn Point. And we wanted to see if we could um, attach oysters directly to the reef ball at a hatchery. So uh, the answer is yes. And we got a pretty good uh, set on the reef balls. And then they were taken out and put in the water. Uh, the idea was to grow them out for a couple of weeks at Horn Point before deployment. Unfortunately, there was a hurricane coming up the coast. And so um, we had to uh, cut the, the grow out short. And I think that that probably detracted from the, uh, the uh, performance of the reef balls up at the uh, uh, Memorial Reef, mm -hmm. because what what we found there, although the hatchery test itself was successful, in the next so slide, if you want to go ahead and flip it up, we had a big mussel set in the upper bay, and they outcompeted the oysters. Mm -hmm. Though there were a few oysters on the uh, on the reef balls, what you're seeing is is what we actually got. Now that makes a great fishing reef, and it's also a filter feeder it's not as good as an oyster. Right. So that pointed to the need that if you're gonna put spat on on, uh, on, an, on a reef ball, you need to grow it out 
in as controlled an environment as you can alongside the dock or something um, to get the oysters established before deploying it to the reef. We want to get ahead of whatever else is out there. So let's go to the next one. This is uh, down on Tillman Island back in uh, 2004. Uh, the Maryland Environmental Service and Oyster Recovery Partnership sponsored a training pool. Uh, we had gotten enough money where we were able to buy some molds. The Reef Ball Foundation um, partially supported our purchase with a grant since MES is a, uh, it's not a nonprofit, but it's a, um, what do they call it? Um, it? It's a special entity of the state of Maryland. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not a nonprofit, but it's a not-for-profit organization that uh, has no money uh, appropriated to it by the legislature, works under contracts to the state, to state agencies, and to uh, the private sector. Uh, so we got a little bit of seed money from the organization and with the grant money from uh, Reefball Foundation, we ordered some molds. We also uh, paid for an, an instructor from the Reefball, actually from um, Reef Innovations, uh, down in Florida to come up and teach us how to use the molds. So uh, ORP, uh, Oyster Recovery Partnership, who funded the uh, reef ball molds for Bill Huppert's MSSA chapter, um, and MES sponsored the training, and we opened it up to everybody who wanted to come. We had uh, Chesapeake Bay Environmental Center. We had Fish and Wildlife Service. We had DNR, um, MES, of course, uh, CBF. And uh, some of the folks in, in the picture here uh, are still out there uh, uh, working on uh, reef balls. And that's me down in the, in the lower picture uh, with, with the ones we produced. They were eventually taken out and placed at the northwest corner of Tillman Island. About uh, a year to two years later, Tom Humbles, um, who unfortunately passed away uh, a few years ago, uh, he was my reef manager. He went out with a drop camera and just kind of not not a not a not a great underwater tool, but it, at least we could see what was there. Because after I had left, he sent me the picture, and he he had a a taw -taw come out from behind one of the reef balls that come to look at the camera. That's so if anybody says there's no taw talk in the upper bay, wrong. They're here. <laughs> Maybe not a lot of them, uh, and they may not be feeding, but they do come up this far. I think so. Those are up uh, in the uh, northwest corner. Now, uh, Bill Cooper, by the way. The gentleman in the upper left-hand corner uh, with the white hat and white hair. Yep. It's easy for me to say white hair now. Uh, that's Bill Huppert. Well, and so. And, you, and that's uh, Vicki uh, Paulus in, yeah. in the picture also from uh, Chesapeake Bay Environmental Center. Absolutely. So when you say the northwest corner, that's the northwest corner of the Tillman Island Reef site? Yes. The Tillman Reef site? Okay, great. I want to run down some of the sizes real quick. It's rare you get I get to see so many of the various sizes in one place. I think we have a pallet ball here, the biggest ones in the picture. Yes. Uh, these are bay balls. And then you have mini bay, which are about 300 pounds. And then I see a low pro hiding in the corner back here. And then this is a low profile uh, reef ball as well. So for folks that are unfamiliar with our program, low profiles are what we largely build with students. Um, and... Uh, and then we do have some mini bays size as well that, that high schoolers and masonry tech centers have been building. And I'm glad you mentioned Vicki at Seabec because a lot of our equipment is hanging out there waiting for uh, some future reef ball builds folks are going to find out about soon. So we'll be doing training pours like this, but actually to build reef balls for various MARI projects um, throughout the remainder of the summer and into the fall. So folks can actually uh, kind of stand by for, for opportunities to volunteer at this kind, these kinds of efforts. If you notice in the uh, way in the back there, uh, in the bottom picture, mm -hmm. there is a reef ball with looks like a big flange on it. Right here, yep. Okay. Uh, that was an experiment that I did here. Uh, at least I, I built the uh, um, a base in my uh, front yard. The, the standard at the time was that if you needed a, a wider base, they put the, the reef ball already built in a, just a frame and they poured concrete around it mm -hmm. and you lose some of the vertical height. So I wondered if we might be able to come up with a way to build a flange, if you will, a base 
and have the reef ball on top of it as a integrated pour. And, and it worked. And it's probably the only one in existence because I, I left about uh, four months later to a different job. And, uh, but um, the idea was to get more weight and, and a broader spread on the bottom uh, so it would, wouldn't tip over. And I was using a mini bay ball that ended up having the same weight as a, uh, a bay ball. Okay. They're 250 pounds. Normally, the bay ball is about 400 pounds. Uh, the uh, mini bay with that, that flange ended up being about 400, and it would retard tipping if somebody hooked into it with an anchor. Right, right. So let's go to the next slide. I don't have any pictures of the, of the reef balls up in the northwest corner. But in the next slide, uh, that is from Drew Payne. Uh, the picture, the actual underwater uh, pictures or video was taken by Robert Monroe aboard the Big Worm. And this is in the Tillman Island uh, fish haven. This is a bridge section. Um, I can tell you it's a bridge section. I can't tell you where it is uh, exactly because this was the most productive corner of it or yeah. section. Um, but you can see what the growth is. And I would anticipate that the reef balls that uh, you have over there at Tillman um, are going to be looking something like that. Yeah, I'm actually going to stop and change the way I'm sharing screens real quick just because I want to show folks that while we're talking about it. So give me one second here. What we're going to do. There we go. I think I got this right. A little bit different, but uh, I actually pulled up an image. This is one of the Tillman Island reef balls uh, deployed in either 2015 or 2016. Um, these were preset with oyster spat. And so what folks are looking at there are four to five inch oysters growing on the mini bay reef ball. Um, there's 388 reef balls out there that are all mini bays. Um, some of them, I think about 80 of them don't have spat, but the majority do. Um, so you can guess that that's what it looks like when it's been slung and, and brought up off the bottom. Um, and then also on our habitat page that I mentioned previously, you can scroll down and actually see a video that we have. Thanks to the folks at, uh, at Ken Island Scuba. You can see them plunging right in there. These are um, only a few months, or I'm sorry, about 14 months after initial deployment. Um, so like you said earlier, you found out that if colonized with oysters in the hatchery setting uh, and they survive, um, they're going to do really well. Um, and other col uh, col uh, colonizing organisms will attach. Um, in these, in these pictures, I haven't seen many mussels. It's probably part of, partly due to where they are salinity wise. Uh, but lots of anemones, um, lots of, uh, tunicates or sea squirts. Um, you can see some of the various things and folks can find this, this video here, um, and in a couple other spots. So we are seeing really good results and, um, I'm not sure if it keeps playing, but there's actually, there's one that's really well colonized. Um, there's actually some video where the divers slip off of the reef ball clusters and do show a little bit of the um, of some of the bridge uh, bridge deck material. So, okay, so let's go to the next one, and this is the uh, pour at the Chesapeake Bay Environmental Center, also known as Horsehead, because of the way it's shaped when you look at it in a satellite image. Um, this was a uh, jointly sponsored by MES and uh, and. At Chesapeake Bay Environmental Center, uh, the reef balls were deployed in Cabin Creek, uh, and uh, we also got some additional reef balls that came up from Florida. Um, this this is the bay ball. Uh, MES no longer has this capability. Uh, they're no, no longer involved in, in making reef balls. Uh, again, they lost their uh, champion, if you will, uh, after Tom Humbles uh, unfortunately passed away. He was actually working on the reef ball project up there at the um, – uh, shipping terminal in, in, um, oh, I just lost the name of it. Senior moment, excuse me. Uh, Masonville. Uh, Masonville. Right. And, and there's a huge number of reef balls in there. Um, and he was involved in a car accident, unfortunately, and, and, uh, uh eventually passed away because of his injuries, a uh, great loss to the program. And, uh, the program went on for a while, but, uh, they went off in a different direction and the moles, I believe eventually went back to the, um, to the reef ball foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is what a, a pour looks like. Um, and, and we poured on two separate days and we got a, a as you can see, a, a, a good, good number of them. And they're all over there in prospect Bay in about uh, six feet of water. 
And uh, I understand that's a pretty good purchase spot. It sure is. And that's exactly what we'll be looking for folks to, to take part in is volunteers, at least three out of the four pictures. It's tough to get volunteers deploying reef balls, but um, the building aspect, uh, these will be truck based pours, just like you sh you've done here. Um, and so a large part of the work is simply assembling the molds, preparing everything, um, and then stripping the molds and, and possibly reassembling them um, when the concrete has, has cured. So what we're going to plan is a number of back-to-back -back days for folks to participate as, as much as possible. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons that I like this technology, because we could get people involved in hands-on reef building. It's not just send money and, and then you're gone, you know. I mean, you can actually participate and, and get a good feel for what we're doing um, and, and make a, a personal contribution to the uh, development of a uh, three-dimensional reef um, in the Bay. We had another pour in, in the next slide with the, uh, actually several pours with the uh, Magathy River Association. We had um, one at South Ferry Terminal, uh, excuse me, South Ferry Marina. We had one at the Anne Arundel Community College, which is shown in the upper left-hand corner, uh, right behind the uh, environmental uh, lab where they grow seagrasses. Hmm. Uh, and I also had one at Annandale High School in Virginia. Uh, it turns out I was, when we first got the molds at MES, I brought one home and I, I decided I, I needed to, we didn't have the training yet. And so I was uh, practicing making reef balls in my front yard and I still catch heck because of some stains on the concrete <laughs> for a walkway. Um, but uh, anyway, um, so I was making it and the guy across the street was a um, administrator with Fairfax County school system. He mentioned it to um, a young lady by the name of Jessica Dahl from Maryland, who was at that time a uh, uh, biology teacher at Annandale high school. And she contacted me and said, can we do a pour at Annandale high school? So we did a pour and uh, those reef balls uh, along with the, the two pours we did at the, um, uh, over there at Magathy River Association, uh, along with a whole tractor trailer load of reef balls, were put out in uh, Magathy River in three sites, two of which are charted, one of which isn't. And I'll talk about that in uh, a minute. Uh, the uh, tractor trailer load of reef balls we got from uh, Larry Beggs at Reef Innovations in Florida. He's the prime reef ball contractor, and Larry's uh, staff also does the training. They've been doing this stuff worldwide and have a tremendous uh, reputation for the, uh, the fine work that they're doing uh, with, with coral restoration. Absolutely. So let's flip to the next one. And the question is, do reef balls float? And the answer is, well, yes, you can float them. This is a deployment technique that the Reef Ball Foundation came up with for um, remote areas. What you do is you, you leave the, the bladder, uh, essentially a, um, a mooring buoy um, marker in the reef ball. That, that's the center part of the, of the reef ball pour. You just leave it in there and then you put it in the water and you uh, float it out to wherever you want to put the reef in. Then you deflate the, uh, the bladder and the reef ball settles to the bottom. There's even a way to tow a, a whole string of them, like a towing a log chain. Um, but uh, this was taken out by the Magathy River Association dive team to a site that I'm not gonna mention because it's their monitoring site. And uh, they left a, a few reef balls uh, out of the, uh, the, the two deployments so that they could have a separate kind of a control site uh, to, to monitor performance. So the two places in, uh, let's see, make my, check my notes here. The two places over in uh, Magathy River, one of them shown here, this is Rock Point. And that picture was taken by uh, Nick Garrett. Uh, the scan was taken by Nick Garrett with a Humminbird mega unit. Uh, it is a huge bait ball over on the left side of the image, circling around the reef balls. And it's probably a little hard to see at this scale, but there are striped bass attacking that school from a variety of different directions. The main body of striped bass are coming in from the bottom right-hand corner, but there are some circling in through the reef balls. And that's exactly what we're looking for. Um, not only is it a perch site, but uh, bait will uh, uh, get attracted to it and circle around it. And it's why it's a hot spot. Yep. So... 
Let's go to the next one. It's great, well, great image, by the way. I want to highlight it is, and I want to highlight the way these reef balls are put down. You can see the clusters of four, six, three. Uh, it's usually because they'll they'll be put together in a little cluster. At least I know when Chesapeake Bay Foundation deploys, um, that's how they've been doing it in little clusters, and that'll happen. And hey, the really calm days, you're going to get you're really under control exactly how you want to lay out your reef. The rougher days, it's a little more difficult. And I say that before I show this next image because I know how structured and well, perfect. Well, just say, go back to the one we're yeah. showing here. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons you put them in clusters, um, it's known as a patch, like a cabbage patch, because you got, you know, some here and some there. Mm -hmm. um, the reefs actually sort of communicate with each other in terms of fish. They'll, they'll swim through them and around them. And so having clusters um, actually increases their biological utilization at least uh, from the reading that I've been done uh, and the, the research I've seen. That doesn't mean that the, the next one, when we go to the next one. Yeah. That doesn't mean that one that's, that is laid out in what they call a smear reef, that it's like a smear on the bottom. It's just a solid patch. That doesn't mean that it won't work. It'll work just fine. Right. Um, but having that, that space between uh, the, the, the clusters sometimes helps, particularly for something like striped bass. That like to cruise around reefs and stuff. Uh, you know, it better matches their uh, their predation pattern. So again, it depends on what you're trying to build. Now for perch, oh, this this thing going to be great. Yeah. And this uh, went in. Uh, let's see, in January, didn't it? It sure did. Yeah. This one has an interesting story behind it. I was uh, leading some reef ball builds in Anne Arundel County, and and a volunteer CCA member came up to me at, at the event and said, "Hey, I'm I'm here to volunteer at a school." Uh, showed up, asked what I was, what was happening with the reef balls. Um, and so I said, well, I like when you build them, I like deploying them in a nearby area so the community can better connect to the habitat they help build. So why don't we talk about a Magathy spot? And, and I learned so much of what you just shared about the Magathy River Association and their work um, just by saying, why don't I bring these reef balls to you? So um, a, a great team of folks uh, came together at the Magathy River Association to make this a reality. And McGuire Marine, as you can tell, uh, can do some precise work um, in what, 14 or 13 and a half feet of water. Uh, they did a good job of placing these are low profile reef balls. And so some of these were built by Old Mill Middle. Uh, some of these were built in by Dunlogan Middle in Howard County. Um, gosh, I'd have to look at my records to see where they, all the rest were. But I think 100 of them went down in this location. And Magathy River Association is right now focused on expanding their permit footprint so we can deploy some more um, possibly in 2022 um, and and actually build them locally as well. So uh, again, that's another opportunity for folks to, to get involved and, and you'll see those opportunities pop up on our website and our newsletters very soon here. Yeah. And, and these weren't, uh, at least the first ones were not put in for oyster restoration per se. Right. Um, yes, they did put some oyster uh, bags in the reef balls uh, after they were deployed, but uh, Magathy River was trying to um, draw more people into their program of trying to preserve the Magathy watershed. And having fishing reefs uh, in the Magathy, they thought would be a good way to, uh, to get um, more people involved. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think you'll find that these are, are really good reefs uh, for panfish. Um, and the Magathy is somewhat protected so that when the bay is really snotty, uh, sometimes you can fish in the Magathy. Absolutely. And I want to bring a comment in real quick from Curtis Hoover. Hopefully we will be in full swing at Cat North again this coming school year. Thank you for making that comment, Curtis. I agree. Uh, Curtis has been a great one of our masonry instructors at Cat North in Anne Arundel County, who uh, has not only been teaching his, his students all the different masonry skills they need uh, you know, to get to be employable uh, well into the future with a great job. Um, he's taken extra time to build reef balls for us, um, mini bay reef balls mostly, uh, so a little bit bigger um, that have ended up in many places, some at the Tillman Reef, um, some actually ended up uh, deployed over this winter at, uh, at Rocky Gap State Park at Lake Habib in Western Maryland uh, in partnership with Maryland DNR. So we end up uh, putting them all over the place. And that's a big part of what the Habitat website's all about is trying to make sure we can tell the story uh, little by little about the partners that are involved, uh, folks like Curtis, you know, guys like you, Wayne. So it is truly a community effort. Um, and, and we're glad to have great partners on, on board. And um, a goal is as many masonry programs as possible across the state. Uh, we'll be building reef balls with us now that we hope uh, hope COVID is completely behind us. Um, we had three operational uh, 
masonry tech centers, um, Anne Arundel County, Carroll County, and um, also Queen Anne County right before the pandemic hit. Uh, and we're hoping all three of them come right back. In fact, Carroll County uh, stayed building largely through the pandemic. Um, and we're looking at some lower Eastern shore partners as well. You know, it's really important that we're working with school kids um, at various levels, middle grade, uh, middle, middle high school and so forth, uh, because you can read about this stuff, but actually going out and do it, uh, doing it, it helps reinforce what you're learning in the classroom and you're making a, a, a hands-on contribution towards uh, environmental restoration. So um, it, it's great that th these folks are involved and, and we can all hope that it will continue and that COVID will allow all of us to get uh, uh, back in high gear. Yeah, yeah, and I wanted to just highlight Ken's comment that he's seen reef balls built at Burley Manor Middle in Howard County as well. Um, you know, the reef balls are great technology that have been used all over the place. And I've found more and more schools that when they have grants and have some programs available and have a hardworking teacher, um, they go ahead and, and tackle this stuff uh, without CCA. And so that's the, the best part. I love hearing about all the history of the different reef ball molds that have been used in the past. And you know, our program really began because we kind of dusted off molds that were sitting in a in a trailer and uh, and not being used um, that Stevenson University had. So um, there's this, this evolution here. And it, it, like you said, it really takes people stepping up that, that care and are connected to our resources in a tangible way to, to really want to give back and build new habitat for the future. So uh, tomorrow is always a new day to add more partners and do more work. Yeah, let me give a shout out to Nick Garrett too. He, he's been great in sharing uh, his, uh, his scans. And uh, in fact, I was so impressed with what he was doing with uh, his mega units that I've, I've just bought a, a mega unit from his uh, little uh, company, uh, Sonar Kings, so that I could uh, get the same quality that he's uh, uh, been uh, sharing with us. So Absolutely. let's go to the next one. This is a load of reef balls that we purchased um, with some grant money. We got uh, some help from the uh, charter captains down in the Solomons, and all those reef balls were put out, uh, about half of them on Little Cove Point, and the other half were over on uh, Cedar Point Reef. Uh, Rick Younger took the picture on the right, and that's about a year after the reef ball's been in the water. That one actually had a few uh, oysters on it that were uh, naturally uh, set, mm -hmm. but uh, you can see the difference in, difference in growth there uh, over at that site. Uh, that they're right near the uh, those big bridge caps. So, then the next one um, is picture at Shady Side. When I was doing dredge material management, I was usually duking it out with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. You know, I mean, I, I was a, a contractor, or at least my agency was for the port, and we were facilitating the search for dredge material placement sites. Um, and unfortunately. I ended up, uh, even though I was uh, the facilitator, I had to uh, push people along sometimes in, uh, in order to get uh, to, to an end product, and we eventually succeeded. But um, we got into, into reef balls, and I was able to work with CBF, because at the time, CBF and a lot of other environmental groups uh, looked at the uh, artificial reef program sort of as uh, fish killing zones. Mm -hmm. You know, you just want to build reefs to go out and kill fish. And I said, no, the way we're managing it, we're trying to put these, these reefs in in such a way that, that they're uh, marine habitat first and that they'll attract sport fish second. Um, and I learned from uh, the reef manager down in Virginia that when you build a big reef, uh, mass is good. It helps the fishermen find it. But you want to put in satellite reefs as well because you don't want it ever to get fished out. And so you... Uh, put in some reefs that are kind of scattered out a little bit, smaller reefs, so that uh, you have some diversity there. Um, and um, you don't want to give everything away because part of this is 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 having something for the fish. It's not just for the, the fishermen. Um, so this is one of our first pours. In fact, our very first pour was with the Jimmy Buffett fan club. That was a blast. No kidding. Yeah, they, they came, we poured the reef balls, and then they had a party afterward and invited the uh, – uh, CBF and uh, MES team to join them for their uh, their parrot head party. And that was the that was the best reef ball pour we ever had. I bet. Well, say <laughs> it was great. There's something about musicians being involved in uh, in reefs because it was Jimmy Buffett then. And if folks missed the the connection, No Shoes Reefs 
is the No Shoes Nation or Kenny Chesney, uh, another well-known artist uh, with a great following. So, you know, that's what it's all about, coming together to build habitat. So, so we had a number of pours at CBF, and then CBF took some of these reef balls and they put them in their hatchery at Shadyside, uh, drawing on that experimental uh, uh, hatchery set we had at Horn Point with Don Merritt, Mutt Merritt and, and company down there that did a great job uh, for MES and DNR. Uh, and th they put the uh, oyster spat on the uh, reef balls, grew them out for a couple weeks at Shadyside, and then the first ones were deployed at Holocaust News. Um, and they were put in, I was out on that deployment and actually helped put them in, got a chance to go out for once and, and actually uh, put some in. And a year later, actually two years later, I guess it is, this is uh, what they pulled up. Mm -hmm. uh, Noah came out with a survey boat and uh, that's one of the reef balls that had the uh, CBF uh, hatchery spat set on it. And again, that's in Eastern Bay. And it's, they got better water over there, I think. Good, it's clear water. It's, it's out of the mainstream, mm -hmm. so it doesn't get quite as uh, cloudy. And uh, had tremendous growth in those reef balls. And additional reef balls have since been placed in there. These are sort of in the center of the site. And there's another large, uh, two large clusters up uh, in the uh, northwest, along the northwest edge of that site. And that is definitely a site squarely in our in our. Uh, and our sites for, for future deployments. Um, the, the folks in the midshore region are looking at Tillman this year with just naked reef balls, no oysters on them. Um, but we're also talking about Holocaust News for future uh, spat set reef balls because the, the pictures tell it all. There's the performance right there for the reef. Well, it's also protected waters for fishermen. Mm -hmm. So um, under certain conditions, you can go out and fish Eastern Bay when you can't fish out in the main stem. Exactly. So having places like this to go uh, is, is really nice. Plus, we have the vertical relief we're looking for and thriving oyster reefs. Now, the next one is Cook Point. And CBF started putting them down there. And then um, some of the, the CCA Maryland reef balls are down there. Those big mounds are actually shell piles, um, the ones in the right-hand corner. Mm -hmm. The uh, seaplane reef, seaplane wreck, actually, is, is nearby. And uh, you can see it up there in the upper right hand, upper upper left hand corner. Yep. We were looking at it to see if there's, we could do something to redevelop it. The charter captain said that seaplane is starting to deteriorate badly. Could we do some of the reef balls down in the area? And about that time, unfortunately, well, fortunately for me, I guess, I left and went back to the Coast Guard after 9-11 to reprise port security work as a civilian. And I got into that and in, in transportation system recovery for 10 years after that. Um, but this site here uh, went in after I left. Uh, those little dimples down around those uh, shell piles and on the shell piles are the reef balls. And this is a hot spot. You want to, Dave, I think you've probably been over there for that one. Absolutely. Yeah. And this has uh, actually also been renamed the Clint Waters Reef. Uh, Clint was a tremendous leader from the, the MSSA chapter. Um, and, and did a lot of the, the heavy lifting and push for, for reefs like this, along with his fellow you know, club members. But uh, so it's been renamed since he has passed. And this is definitely a spot we have, uh, we're focused on as well for some more reef balls soon. It's, it's a great spot. Again, it's also somewhat protected um, and uh, it's easy to get to. And it's, a, it's you know, the fish move around, okay? Mm -hmm. But still, it's a hot spot and it's worth checking when you're in the area. Absolutely. Now, reef balls can also be used for shoreline stabilization. The folks down at Chesapeake Ranch Estates, just outside of Solomon's, had have you know some a historic problem of um, the cliffs falling off and houses falling into the into the bay. Uh, they were unable to put in shoreline protection because their cliff face, sandstone cliff face, is inhabited by the tiger beetle which is endangered in Maryland. And therefore they can't cover the, the slope with, with rocks or with concrete or, or, or whatever, because it would take away the habitat of this endangered tiger beetle, which only lives in a very tiny uh, surface layer. They got a permit to put in reef balls because the reef balls don't take away from the natural erosion from rainwater that the tiger beetles need. Hmm. Um, 
but the, the reef balls break the, the reefs that are out there that were poured into Solomon's by the uh, uh, homeowners and they're they're uh, reef balls they're they're the big they're big ones they're they're about, probably about 1500 pounds they're 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 huge mm -hmm. um, and they're in three rows and there are two locations where you'll find them along the shoreline when the stripers are feeding shallow and along the shoreline this is a place to check um, oh, yeah. but what they do is that they break up the wave energy and they retard the erosion at the base of the cliff, but yet there's still enough surface erosion to support the tiger beetle. So um, here we have a marine habitat um, designed reef used for shore stabilization, helping a land-based critter. Uh, now, there's other places in, in Maryland where shoreline stabilization is occurring, including, I believe, in South River, there's uh, one up there, uh, where there's a living shoreline project. Now, I don't have any pictures of that. I, I don't know if, were you involved in that one? or uh, We absolutely were. We, we uh, In fact, some of the reef balls that Curtis made at Cat North ended up there. Um, we donated some of them. Uh, CBF was a big supporter of that. And uh, uh, let me see if I can pull up a few pictures, but we won't stop the conversation. Well, you're looking for the pictures. Uh, Potomac River now also has some reef balls at National Harbor. Uh, DNR decided that they wanted to try and put some structure in there. And so they had a reef ball for uh, CCA uh, Northern Virginia, of which I'm a member, uh, went over and helped out as volunteers because we decided we wanted to become more involved in hands-on reef building. And we've had a couple of, of pours since. Uh, with uh, CCA Maryland's uh, resources. And I think we're uh, now looking at uh, working with folks down in, uh, in Leonardtown and St. Mary's River. Um, these reef balls are, are in that, uh, National Harbor, and uh, they're on my list as soon as I can get my, uh, my engine repaired to get out and get a scan with that new uh, Mega Plus unit. I found a picture. There's, there's uh, South River. Uh, Turnbull Estates, and so these are some mini bay reef balls. Um, depending where you are on the shoreline, there's either rocks, which are more of a traditional or more recently used uh, living shoreline um, construction or unit. Um, the reef balls are placed in between, and in some cases, there's soldier grows of, of more than just one. Uh, I'm not sure if this is one of those locations or not, but uh, in fact, yeah, I can see them here in the deeper water. Um, the ones that are on the deeper side of the shoreline were set with spat by CBF. Uh, and I know they continue to do monitoring here. Um, you can see they did some uh, marsh grass planting as well back here on the beach side of things. Um, as far as I know, all is moving in the right direction with this shoreline as designed. Um, and I think it's about two years old at this point. Let's, let's also mention that reef balls are a special design. Other reef products uh, also work for uh, shoreline stabilization and for reefs. And materials of opportunity also work. Uh, we like the reef balls, at least I do, and one of the reasons I, I pushed them um, was because of the ability to build them with volunteers, the, sm the smaller uh, modules, to, to get people involved in, in the hands-on building of reefs. But the reef balls, with their concave holes, uh, cause swirls as current uh, moves through them. And the, and the way they've been tested in, in wave tanks, and the currents actually take nutrients or whatever – that the oysters, for example, need, or, or the, the other marine organisms, and they go all around the ball because of the design. Mm -hmm. The hole in the top is there because if you didn't have the hole in the top and a wave went over top of it, it, it would actually create hydraulic pressure and pick it up off the bottom. So by having the hole in the top, when the wave goes over, it pulls it pulls the, the water up through the reef ball, and that helps with the, with the circulation. So it's, it's a really neat uh, product, one that's easy to use, particularly in the smaller sizes uh, for, the, for the volunteers. And, and then they also have a special mixture so that uh, uh, they become hydraulic cement um, and their, their surface is pH neutral, which is needed for, for oysters. Again, they're specially designed, well, actually for hard corals as well. They're specially designed for hard corals, and that's why we like them but they have to go on the right kind of bottom. So, um, and that's why I'm a big fan of them. Uh, yes, I help bring them in, but uh, they work. And 
I'd like to encourage folks to uh, support uh, the program. Now, the next slide will show you where they are I'm, uh, in, I'm, in a general I'm, sense. I'm glad you mentioned the pH because I saw this question come, that came in earlier from one of our YouTube viewers uh, related to the pH. Um, and the concrete is, does allow the calcium-based organisms like an oyster to attach and to grow. And so it's, it's not as good as an oyster shell necessarily, um, but there's many ways to, to mess with the mix uh, or to, to change the mix. And Reef Ball Foundation does make sure that, you know, the mixes are correct to, to allow a balance where there's no impact to the environment and, and that the animals that are attaching are going to thrive. But all of this does take funds. And so it's, it's, we want to have people volunteer. Uh, I still volunteer when I can. I got a bad back, so I go and I'm pretty much more the picture taker. Uh, but, um, uh, and I'm going to try and uh, help out with the scans, like over at the National Harbor, see if I can get some good scans of, of what's over there. But it does take funding. And so, uh, folks, uh, if, you, if you want to see uh, good reefs, one way to support them is to um, make donations to, the, uh, to uh, CCA Maryland, CCA Northern Virginia, uh, to uh, CBF. And uh, St. Leonard's, uh, I'm not sure, the, I can't remember the exact name of the, the organization Mary's, down there. St. Mary's River Watershed Association. Uh, they're doing some great work down there in the St. Mary's River. Uh, and so your support is needed to continue this work. Absolutely. Absolutely. So in here so, are, I think we're, these are second to last slide here. Um, so these are some of the spots that we've been talking about. Masonville Cove was the mitigation project you mentioned up here that has a large number of reef balls there, Memorial Reef, um, and, and some of the other spots. Um, I'm glad you put Dolly's Lump on here because this is another spot uh, that I think would be a, a great spot for additional reefing, just given the, the volume of anglers that come out of Sandy Point State Park um, that fish in the Annapolis area. Um, I'm hoping we can do something there. Um, we showed you the South River shoreline. Um, the one reef site we're looking at is just above Old Rock um, for a July or August deployment that CBF is leading. Um, Jane's Island is largely a empty reef site. Uh, there are some there's some old material there, but you know not in decades. So we're we're happy to. I think the design we're going to implement there, hopefully next week, um, is going to be small clusters like you mentioned. Um, I was thinking about it from a fishability standpoint and uh, being able to kind of anchor up and fish to a bunch of reef and, and have plenty of room for, for plenty of boats to spread out was my thought process. But, you know, from an ecological standpoint, it makes sense too. Um, and, you know, th that's one of the reasons that the uh, Tillman Island reef, the uh, passenger vessel uh, terminal material was laid in two parallel lines, but it was laid across the dominant current. And the idea was uh, coordinated with the, uh, in fact, recommended and suggested and recommended by the uh, Tillman Island charter cabins. Mm -hmm. Because if you put the, the reef um, in a straight line with the current, one boat can anchor up current. If you put it across the current, then more boats can anchor up and, and float uh, their uh, live line or their, their chunk bait back. Now, it may one of the things that it, it may help to actually put them on a slight angle, mm -hmm. again, to help uh, the current sweep through there and help keep them clean. So... Uh, perpendicular to the current may not be quite as good as having a, on a slight angle. Because when you look at the old oyster reefs, uh, the work that done by Jeff Halka and others at Maryland Geological Survey with their sub-bottom profiling, the, the oyster reefs tended to be slanted hmm. and down current. And so one of the ideas is to try and put a reef in so that it will replicate the performance of an oyster reef. Even if it doesn't get oysters, um, that's how they, they grew. And I think it it's best to mimic nature if we can. That's a great point. I'll, I'll take that to heart, uh, given that we have kind of a blank slate with uh, with next week's hopeful deployment at Jane's Island. Maybe we'll try some some angled pieces there as best we can. Um, so, Wayne, we, we talked about your, you being an author, and uh, we haven't really talked about the books that much because you have so much to share about reef balls, but I want to make sure folks are aware that information like this and a lot, a lot more is available. Um, Wayne's books are on Amazon. Uh, it just happens to be the easiest way to distribute everything these days. So folks can go on there and click a button and probably have it on your doorstep tomorrow or the next day. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have all three books right here. 
and I do pick away at them when I have time. <laughs> uh, thankfully, I get to learn about this stuff on a daily basis. Um, but on the screen now, we have uh, a great little snippet of, of the information from the books in from Fish Talk magazine. Uh, how often can folks find your stories and, and some of the maps and charts and images in Fish Talk? Uh, Lenny's been pretty much running them, uh, Lenny Rudow, uh, pretty much uh, constantly uh, every month. Um, uh, what I did was I made the excerpts available. Uh, this is a niche market, you know, and I, I wrote the first book, Bridges Under Troubled Waters, because we never had a field manual for the uh, Maryland artificial reefs. And in essence, it's a field guide. Uh, it has a lot of other stuff in there. It's got Holland Island in there um, and uh, some history and, and some other things. It has the reef ball the history, uh, where we put them and, and so forth uh, on oyster sanctuaries. So it, it's sort of a historical piece as, as well. Um, and uh, I tried writing it when I was at Maryland Environmental Service, but I ran out of time. And so, and I didn't have enough uh, material about the bottom, scans and other stuff. And by taking a scan here and there while I was out fishing, uh, I was able to accumulate enough and finally turn the manuscript into a, into a book. And then Lenny came up with the ma with uh, the magazine, and I said, "Gee, I wonder if I could uh, maybe write a few articles for uh, Fish Talk." Mm -hmm. And so I, I gave him a couple. Uh, these are contributions; they're they're not non-pay. Um, and I noticed that he was not getting good coverage in Virginia. So I said, "Gee, I wonder if I could write something uh, about Virginia reefs. I wonder if there's enough information." So I started researching it, had fished a few of them, and uh, three weeks later, I had written a book for all of the Virginia uh, Bay artificial reefs. And I added a bunch of stuff for um, Maryland as well, including the, the research technique, the armchair scouting, if you will, that I've been doing uh, using, uh, and I've been doing this for quite a while because when I had to go look for uh, dredge material potential placement options, I was using every resource possible. So the technique that I'm using is, you know, satellite images, uh, uh, published uh, research, unpublished research, uh, whatever. So I described how to do it and gave a bunch of examples up and down the uh, the entire uh, main stem of the uh, uh, of the uh, bay. Both books also include some material for the Upper Potomac River. Uh, and then the next two books were all about shipwrecks. One covers Maryland and the, the Lower Potomac, and the uh, fourth one covers um, the uh, shipwrecks and obstructions. Yeah, uh, phantoms of the Lower Bay. That cover, by the way, on the on the phantoms. That's actually a tug uh, up on end uh, in the bay, uh, a multi-beam sonar picture from NOAA that I found on their uh, website. It's a public domain thing uh, done by a contractor, but since they publish it, it's public domain. Uh, and so, hey, that's a great cover. And that book also includes all of the offshore uh, Virginia Marine Resources Commission reefs. They've got some great reefs down there mm -hmm. uh, in Virginia. Uh, and um, I'm working with the uh, the uh, Virginia Saltwater Sport Fishing Association trying to help get their reef committee reestablished to uh, see if they can uh, get some more material into some of these reefs. So there, there's a lot of good information out there. I don't cover all of them. Uh, the uh, Fish Talk articles are available online for free. Go to the Where To page on the Fish Talk magazine website. Um, Lenny's got some great stuff in there, uh, and uh, there's more to come. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, there's a one important topic I want to close out with that you've talked to me about uh, over over time and, and spoke to how important it is for recreational anglers to have a voice and be involved in some future planning that's happening. Um, and so I, I did add those extra slides here uh, related to what we do to maintain channels and dredges and then what happens to it. Because, you know, I, I talk about our habitat program and we're pretty focused. We're looking at, at reef balls. We're involved in oyster advocacy. Uh, the water column and what's in the water, uh, whether it be bad things like plastics and pollution, um, you know, or nutrients, uh, that's habitat too to a fish. And that's a lot of where CCA's focus is. Um, but these islands that we build, um, this one, Poplar Island, um, you know, everybody fishes around it. I know there's great fishing on all sides. So let's talk a little bit about this with our last couple slides and, uh, and move on. Well, Popper, uh, as, as you know, was one that basically had eroded. By the way, Popper is 
the site, I believe it's the only Indian massacre in the Chesapeake Bay. Huh. So uh, that, that's, uh, that's an interesting story, uh, which I cover in one of the books. Um, and there's a book about Popper Island, uh, uh, originally known as Popley Island. Hmm. The uh, Popper Island was effort, it was built, uh, started filling up, and we came up with an idea of having a northward extension, and that is currently uh, finishing up uh, in terms of building hmm. to extend its life. The, the, the dredging is a never-ending need, and I really can't talk a lot about it here. We don't have that much time. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we should uh, do another uh, set or oh, we're to, going to go into more, more detail. But um, the, the reef, there, there are some artificial reefs there. One of them has been covered by the new uh, North Extension. But there is a, a series of rock piles off the northwest corner of the original uh, mm -hmm. Popper Island uh, restoration project. Uh, current patterns have changed over there, so we don't know what that's going to do. That was a real hot spot, but whether it, uh, it's going to be as productive with the current changes with the new uh, northward extension, I don't know. But all of that rock along the outside, mm -hmm. the perimeter, uh, is all marine habitat below the, the surface. And if you pick the right spot, sometimes there's a rockfish there. There's also a um, test dike that was put in before the, the main dike was built that was going to be where the main dike was, and it turned out the bottom wasn't suitable. And that was part of the reason for the test. Uh, it's deteriorated from what it was, but sometimes the rockfish will push bait in there, and uh, it happens once, twice a year maybe. And if you happen to be going by it, go over and take a look because yeah. some sometimes you, you catch it. But also know that it's not marked. It used to have two markers on it. One was lit. Um, the markers have been carried away. So um, don't try running on close to the dike at night or you'll take the bottom out of your boat. Now, is that, uh, it's a little kind of, almost looks like a little jetty that sticks out parallel to it on the west side? Kind of. It's, uh, yeah, on the southwest side and it's parallel to the main dike. I think it's out could, about uh, maybe 50 yards or so. This could be it in the image here, in the picture. I'm kind of waving my cursor around it out on the right side there. Um, but yeah, no, that's definitely a good yeah. spot. And uh well, and, and like I said in the intro a little bit to this topic, um, these present an opportunity for fishing. They're a necessary part of uh, maintaining shipping channels and such. We are going to bring this back for a, a future conversation because um, the the next the plan for what comes after Poplar Island and then after that, um, I think, is what we're talking about next year, right? Well, we have what's called the, the Mid-Bay Project. It's something that I started uh, working on when I was with MES, I was on the original uh, trip that went out and looked at the James Island to, to look at the possibility of restoring it. It was suggested by the uh, Solomon's Charter Captains. They told us, uh, well, we don't fish in there, so, so maybe why don't you put an island in there? Well, light tackle wasn't as big as it is now, and we had no information from light tackle fishermen. It turns out there is a huge underwater debris field of timber on the uh, west side of James Island. This, this island, or, or series of little islets, used to be connected to Taylor's Island. It was huge. Um, and it had a, a little forest on there. And all that de debris is in the water. And if you go zipping up the west side, you don't know where you're going, you will hit something you don't want to hit. Trust me, because some of this stuff is, is right below the surface. Some of it's out of there. Um, some of it's below the surface, some of it's sticking out. But it's a it's a great uh, fishing spot um, in close to the island. So we did a study um, and found that there's a huge amount of sand right there at James Island in that in the center of that footprint. Um, the the port and the Corps of Engineers who actually uh, builds uh, these islands uh, because they're federal projects for federal navigation projects. They're required to have a local sponsor. The Maryland Port Administration is the officially the, uh, or the, actually the Maryland Department of Transportation and their agent is the NPA, is the sponsor uh, for the state. And they provide funding. But under the legislation for Popper Island, and I, I believe the same thing for these, the state of Maryland gets to operate the sites. Uh, the uh, gentleman that I was uh, under contract to, or my division, uh, with Frank Hammonds of the Maryland Port Administration. And he did not just want to send money to the state. He wanted to keep the state involved 
in the actual operation of the site, um, to have a say in how it was developed um, and, and keep the fully engaged. And so one way they did that was to have uh, work with the state senators and Senator Sarbanes got uh, language in the law that authorized uh, and directed that the operations be done by the state of Maryland. Um, and then state of Maryland through the MPA contracted with Maryland Environmental Service to operate the site as uh, we were doing also for Hart Miller Island. In fact, when we uh, started uh, to the operations at Poplar after it was built, we had a jump start. So we took half the equipment from Hart Miller, put it on a barge and barged it down the, to uh, Poplar Island and uh, got it all set up, got a construction trailer, um, put it up. We got some light standards with uh, generators so we get some power. And then we took uh, Frank out there to uh, uh, check out the, uh, the new operation. And uh, he saw that there was a, a lights on in the uh, construction trailer and he had some other people with him. He said, well, everything's working. They got power running in through the window, you know, the cord. And he went in there and it was hooked to a coffee pot. <laughs> hey, that's a priority. <laughs> uh, for sure. For sure. So anyway, um, th this is the preferred footprint um, and it's planned for construction, I understand, in 2024 to start construction. It'll take probably a couple of years to build it. And it's huge. It's huge. Um, the other one is Barren Island. Um, and Barren Island is going to be more of a, of a low uh, marsh kind of uh, restoration the, the major portion of the marshes are going to be at, at Barron Island. Uh, part of the idea is that the port has to have uplands. If you don't have an upland island, you don't get hardly any capacity. Mm -hmm. And they have a huge dredging problem. Pro problem. It's not quite as big as it was when I was there. The sedimentation rates had dropped some. But we're talking millions of yards of, of dredge material a year. And in order to get the capacity, you have to have uplands and get them up high. To, to basically to pile up the, the, the wet dirt. Mm -hmm. And we like to call it wet dirt as opposed to mud because a lot of folks that are against the project call it, it uh, uh, sludge because it looks like sludge, okay? Mm -hmm. But it's mud, okay? It's wet mud. Now, one of the problems with bay mud uh, and with well, any mud and salt water is that marine organisms have a, a high sulfur content. And when they die, the the sediment gets sulfur in them. So, so when the sediment goes out of the water, uh, you get an acidification problem. And the only stuff that likes to grow in it is Phragmites. So there's some treatment requirement uh, to try and neutralize the soil. Hmm. Um, but uh, it's clean material because it's coming from uh, the channels outside the harbor, as opposed to the stuff inside the harbor, which has higher um, contaminants. It's not hazardous. Uh, material and it can be put into places like Masonville, but it's this, uh, a, a different uh, problem. Anyway, uh, when these islands are built, they don't look like a marsh or don't look like an island. It looks like a you know protected shoreline. Mm -hmm. The idea is you have to have the protection, to, and it has to be high enough because of sea level rise, uh, both relative sea level rise where we have uh, land sinking and uh, actual sea level rise. Um, and you got to protect it against storm waves as well as just normal uh, waves and chop from uh, uh, all the traffic out here in the bay. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't look like a restoration island from the outside. It looks like a natural restoration when you're in one of the cells. Gotcha. Now, after these two were built, we're talking 20 years out, 25 years out. Huh? I don't know how long it's going to be before they're filled. They're going to need additional placement projects. And where they would go is the next issue. And they have to start planning them about the time they start building this one, because it takes 15 or 20 years in order to get one of these projects online and to get it through federal authorizations and uh, federal appropriations. So they have to start early. Uh, in order to, to have it ready when these projects are filled. Yeah. And the next projects, 
I believe are potentially the, the sites that I think would, the ones that I would recommend if I was still there, that they get looked at, uh, I hope folks will give me for saying this, are some fishing hotspots. And I'm not going to say any more right now. Uh, we can go back and explore that more later. But one of my concerns is that the recreational fishing community, other than charter cabins, has never been involved in the program. And down the road, and not that far down the road, some consideration may be given to spots that are important to recreational fishermen, and they need to have organizational representation, I believe, in the port's dredge material management program. Absolutely. Well, so I know uh, there's a couple comments I want to bring up on the screen, so I'll make sure you see them. Uh, one is from Kevin McMenamin uh, from the Annapolis Anglers Club. Uh, Dave and Wayne, do you care to share the association between oyster rock, a.k.a. oyster bars, and rockfish? Or striped bass? O oyster rock is basically an oyster reef as opposed to natural rock. Um, if you go over to Sharps Island, there's some natural rock over there. Some folks say it's ballast. I can tell you, it's, there may be some ballast in there, but there's a huge amount, uh, if you know where to look for it, of natural rock. There's also some foundation material from the old hotel. Uh, this part of the Talbot found, uh, formation um, of unconsolidated rock, and it has oysters on it, and it's a natural oyster reef, and the reason it's probably still there is because it's an oyster reef made of natural rock, not of oyster rock, and therefore uh, I suspect, and I don't know, that the old-time watermen um, called uh, you know called it stone rock be, uh, because it's stone as opposed to oyster rock which is made out of calcium right and oyster rock or stone rock are great places to find rock fish so many say that yeah. our local name for striped bass rock fish is because they hang around oyster rock and we know they definitely hang around any kind of structure so um and here's uh one from wayne is awesome He's always willing to talk and share his knowledge. I loved his books just as much as I love finding some of these on the reefs on the side scan. So, folks, as you can tell, there's a ton of information that, that Wayne has shared through his books. Uh, Felipe is, is, of course, one of many anglers who has the books and knows how to go out and find some of these reefs. Um, we all know that fish love structure. And then Super Spooker, great show. Needed this. A lot of doom and gloom lately, but this sparks some hope. Brightened up my day. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, this is why our habitat work is so important at CCA Maryland, advocating for things and being involved in the fisheries uh, debates and, 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 you know, frankly, failures uh, is defeating. <laughs> but building habitat, um, if you see one of our reef ball trailers, it does say fish, uh, habitat today, fish tomorrow. Habitat today, fish tomorrow. You know, Wayne was talking about that earlier, how uh, habitat or, or artificial reefs are not just fish aggregating things. Uh, they're here to, to build fish, to produce fish, to produce habitat. Um, and so it is a definite optimistic type thing. It's a lot of hard work, um, but we want a lot of folks involved in it. And, and the knowledge shared in the books and a little bit of what we shared tonight uh, hopefully motivates folks to get involved. And uh, Michael, cool. Wayne, what do you think? Can we put a bunch of humongous reef balls down south big enough to keep the Menhaden boat from operating in the bay? Well, when I went to CBF and uh, was marketing uh, the idea of reef balls to them as a volunteer poor thing, one of my my points of order was when you put a, a large enough reef ball or group of reef balls on an oyster sanctuary, it's an obstruction to mechanical oyster dredging and to poachers. Um, I believe that that's one of the reasons that the watermen don't like them. Watermen uh, often, many, not all watermen, uh, but some, uh, have uh, opposed reef balls for who knows what reason, you know, they get in the way of crab lines or whatever. But the simple fact is they're an obstruction and mechanical oyster dredges do not like obstructions. They like flat bottom, uh, even flat hard bottom. But uh, the more oyster uh, reefs we can put up there with vertical relief, the better chance we have that they won't become uh, or be, how I say, turned back from sanctuary to harvesting. You may have heard uh, um, it, not too long ago, the oyster, uh, the watermen wanted some of the sanctuaries opened up. Uh, some of the, the uh, talking points, I think, were, uh, well, you need to clean the bar, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. Well, if you got a flat bar, maybe you do. 
because you know it gets covered with sediment, and then they're probably right. But if you got vertical relief, um, you're you're getting the uh, oysters up into that cleaner water, and uh, the current is helping uh, keep the uh, the reef clean. And uh, we're retarding or or at least inhibiting uh, poaching by mechanical oyster dredges. Now you can still go out with tongs. You can, a diver can go out and, and haul them off, but it's not as efficient uh, as uh, or it can't get as many as a mechanical dredge. So uh, I like the idea of obstruction on a sanctuary and uh, quite frankly on a fish haven. Uh, just putting them out there in, in the bay where the uh, Manhattan guys are fishing, well, they're fishing up higher up in the water column. And so it probably wouldn't wouldn't work, but I, I don't think that's a good idea. Let me say this about the Manhattan guys. I, uh, there's folks that are making a living off of those boats. Um, in uh, it's largely a minority community down there in uh, uh, Virginia, um, and wh whereas I, I have often supported with writing, um, uh, you know, public comments and stuff against harvesting the Menhaden in the Bay because of it being a nursery and grow it area for the, the Menhaden. Uh, don't get the small ones. Go offshore where the, you have the the, the bigger ones. Um, so. You, you got to take more fish to get the biomass if you're in the bay than if you're out with harvesting the, the, the big men Hayden. But when the folks make their decisions in fishery management, I, I feel they need to consider the communities that are impacted uh, by the changes. And uh, there is a minority community down there that has been fishing for years on the Menhaden boats. And uh, uh, if, if the quotas are, are cut uh, or even shut down, some consideration needs to be given uh, to to that community uh, to to those workers. At the same time, we need that the Menhaden for forage in the bay, Absolutely, and especially yeah. now with the uh, striped bass under pressure. Yeah, and it's a uh, natural resource. Now, I right? don't want to get political, you know, but but I I, I I feel that it is important to to look at all sides of the question, and it's not just we need to stop the Menhaden. We do need to understand the the impacts as well as the commercial. A benefit of the Menhaden oil and the products that it's involved in. Yeah, there's a lot of complexity in all the issues we work on in natural resource policy. And we'll go back to habitat, you know, trying to find a place to, to place reefs and stuff is not simple. Um, it's part of the day-to-day -day work I do that most folks don't hear about. Uh, same thing with Menhaden. Um, no matter what we want, no matter what folks may share on social media, share in the in their echo chambers that we all live in at times. Um, it is very complicated, as you stated, Wayne, and no matter what folks want to do and, and see the outcome, or, you know, see the outcome be, it takes stepping up, getting involved, getting organized um, to, to share your voice with decision makers. And your voice isn't the only voice out there. So uh, I'm glad you mentioned that there's always multiple sides to every issue that w we face. Um, but again, this habitat work we're doing is a way to engage folks in the future of our Chesapeake Bay. Um, we all care about it for various reasons. Um, we all have different perspectives and that's never going to go away. Um, you say you didn't want to bring up politics, but I, I'm a firm believer that there's politics in everything. Um, and it's how we treat each other as well. Um, it, maybe not left versus right, red versus blue kind of politics, but, uh, we all need to realize that this is a, a, a big natural resource that we all have to share a national treasure like the Chesapeake Bay. So, you know, we have the opportunity every day to roll up our sleeves and do some good work or, uh, argue. <laughs> so habitats where that, that you can roll up your sleeves and help out. And uh, I urge everybody to get copies of Wayne's books at Amazon. And uh, I hope you learned some inf great information tonight. Uh, we will be back to talk about the islands to talk about more work and uh, stand by. You're going to see some pictures here of some reefs being built in the upcoming weeks, uh, which is was really exciting. And uh, I hope all of you and maybe even Wayne uh, will come out to a reef ball build relatively soon. And um, we're all in this together, folks. So Habitat today for Fish Tomorrow. So th thank you all very much. Wayne, any uh, last words? No, but thanks for the opportunity to uh, share the information. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us all the way uh, through the World Wide Web, folks. Um, and uh, again, check out Amazon for Wayne's books and ccamd.org slash habitat for more about our habitat program. And uh, why don't you stop by All Tackle, anybody this week, and, uh, and pick up a No Shoes Reef shirt and, uh, and support our program. Thank you.